Good evening, and welcome everybody to the European Movement in Conversation with John Berker, or as I like to think of him still, Mr. Speaker. John, uh, you're extremely welcome this evening, where I believe you're in Battersea, which is in the heart of uh, Wandsworth for Europe, which is one of the largest branches of the European movement across the country, which must be cause and effect. Well, well that is extraordinarily That's generous of you, although it might be regarded as an example of spin, Andrew. But nevertheless, <laughs> I will take that in the spirit in which it is proffered to me. And good evening to you and to all who've been kind and generous enough to give up a part of their Friday evening to be with us. You're all with us, and I'm also extremely grateful to the European Movement team, particularly Scott Daniels, who's behind the scenes, uh, the uh, Master of Ceremonies, who's organised everything, and will be fielding your questions in due course. And uh, we're really looking forward to this hour and a half. The first half is going to be a straightforward conversation between John and myself about uh, his views on the European and wider situation, and then we'll be really glad to have your questions and uh, John can interact with them directly. He's used to taking questions from all comers. Um, he, uh, he may correct your, um, uh, your grammar or do those other things he used to do from the chair if you're not careful. So make sure that they're properly phrased. And, uh, but anyway, we're really looking forward to it. It's going to be a great hour and a half. Well, John, there's a sense of um, deja vu, isn't there? Or somebody once said of uh, life, it's deja vu all over again. You became speaker at the end of one uh, big uh, standards and expenses crisis and most of your speakership well i suppose the second half of it was absorbed by brexit and we are now a few years later and we are still absorbed by brexit and we have yet another expenses crisis does it feel as you sit there in battersea and have gone through over does it feel like uh, deja vu and what does it feel like being one step removed from it rather than in the speaker's chair well, it's certainly a peculiar sensation. And yes, there is a sense of deja vu. I mean, there are differences, but there are, of course, some common threads. And I suppose the common thread between 2009 and 2021 is Parliament under the spotlight and the potential for a sizable gap, conceivably even a chasm, between representatives and the represented and clearly i think this debate about standards about process about what is in order and what isn't will probably run for some time to come i mean at the heart of it i think is a question of the role of the member of parliament and whether by and large we think that members of parliament are or should be doing a full-time job or whether we think it is one of a number of jobs that they do. I do have a view about that. And for some years, my view has been that members of parliament should be regarded as doing a full-time job. Now, you can get into the interstices of the system and debate the detail and indeed to some degree, the intricacies of how you configure a system which is both proper and fair, and it's not totally straightforward. In other words, you can pronounce from the pulpit, well, there should be no outside employment at all, but it's quite difficult to do that when you look at the detail and you consider that someone is a qualified doctor or is a qualified solicitor or is the director of a family business or whatever. So it's not completely simple, but you can, develop and articulate and commit to a series of principles and then a set of practices on which everybody agrees. And it seems to me that at the moment, frankly, we haven't got that. And there's precious little sign, as far as I can see, of the Prime Minister leading on this matter, perhaps at least in part, because he has traditionally been part of the very system which is now under heavy scrutiny and criticism. I don't think Boris would be too keen on banning all outside interests, would he? You know him uh, better than I do, but uh, he's one who uh, has many irons in the fire at every, uh, at, at, uh, every stage of his career, hasn't he? I think he would be what extremely would be like? unenthusiastic about time MP forevermore. I think he'd be extremely unenthusiastic about a complete prohibition. It seems to me that 
as far as I can tell, in respect of this matter, as of so many others, he is just seeking whether well or badly I leave your jurors to judge to manage what's happening now by his imitation, and I'm afraid it is but an imitation, of statecraft or real poverty. Is there any sense that here's a person with a strong set of principled convictions from which he cannot be budged? If that is what you think, and I'm sure you don't, Andrew, I would suggest that you would be in serious need of urgent medical attention. And I would be inclined... I think you can tell by the expression on my face, I think... ...in front of my very eyes. Now, you, you, you've been in politics a long time, John. Do you think, actually, if you take the long view, have standards in public life declined, Or do we go up and down, and to some extent it depends upon particular individual, individuals who happen to be prominent at any given any given moment. I mean, the expenses, the first expenses, cash for questions and expenses issues go right back to the 90s, don't they? And I'm enough of a historian to know that Lloyd George, before the First World War, was busy trading in the shares of the Marconi Company, which he'd been busy giving contracts. Even the sainted Mr. Gladstone, who is probably my greatest hero amongst prime ministers, amazingly, in the 1880s, was trading in the shares of the Suez Canal when his government was nationalising it. Yes. And with his uh, feigned inability ever to see any conflict of interest, he, uh, he said he wasn't even uh, aware that uh, there were any issues involved in the relationship between these two. Do you think this is just a That's a wonderful to, um, human broad nature. historical That's sweep, Andrew. That is a wonderful yeah. broad historical sweep. The short answer to your question is no. I don't actually think standards are worse now than they have been in the past. I think that the focus is much greater than in the past. The demand for transparency is rightly that much more insistent. And that insistent demand for transparency means that there is, if you like, a media frenzy and appetite for the production of stories, the regurgitation of stories, the dwelling upon the most egregious examples of abuses and so on and so forth. But do I think standards on the whole are worse than in the past? No, I don't actually think so. And in fairness, and maybe some people listening won't agree, I do genuinely believe that the vast majority of members of parliament work extremely hard, dedicatedly and passionately for their constituents. And so, in a sense, one of the saddest and most damnable features of there being a great controversy over one case, and indeed over the government's handling of it, is that it tends to cause everybody to be tarred with the same brush. And that seems to me to be grievously unjust, because most MPs are not engaged in any misconduct at all. And indeed, I'd rather go along with the view of the political commentator Steve Richards, a very discerning commentator, that far from being out of touch with their constituents, on the whole, MPs are more in touch with their constituents than ever before. They won't do exactly what every constituent wants, of course not, because they have to take a view and express opinions and cast votes and take stances, and so they'll please some people and displease others. But MPs are more active in and on behalf of their constituents now than has ever been the case in the past. The great majority of MPs don't have outside interests and they are beavering away locally and nationally, either in the chamber nationally or on committees or in all party groups, et cetera, et cetera, to try to do the right thing by the people who elected them. So no, standards aren't worse. I think there is an issue about individual cases. And I personally do think, and this may not be popular, there is an issue about the fairness of the regime to which members are subject. I think there are very good arguments for saying that a member who is accused of misconduct and is subject to allegations should have a proper right of appeal. In my opinion, he or she should have access to material that is circulated about him or her by the Parliamentary Commission of the Standards. I'm not myself convinced that the process should be protected by parliamentary privilege. Parliamentary privilege exists in order to facilitate whistleblowing by MPs and to ensure that 
other parts of the state can't disadvantage or crush the legislature. I don't think privilege exists to protect an investigator or a standards commissioner, a decision maker, against the possibility of making a badly wrong decision. The argument that's always used about uh, not banning um, outside interests is that it would dissuade uh, people of, of great experience of going into politics. And that's um, always um, uh, been said in the past. And, uh, and though, uh, of course, everyone accepts that the prime responsibility of a member of parliament should be to their constituents, if you said you couldn't do anything else at all, then uh, uh, is that going to put, put many people off going uh, anywhere near politics as a career? And what would at all mean? I mean, does it mean that somebody who's, who's a journalist and does journalism, that's going to be banned? Where would you draw the line? I'm not sure, Andrew, that the chilling effect would be as great as sometimes people suppose. In many cases, of course, people have had very successful careers before they've come into Parliament and would very likely, if they've got a public service mission and vocation, be willing to commit to that public service mission or vocation anyway, even if they didn't have the opportunity to earn extra while in Parliament. But meeting you in a sense... Andrew, halfway, I suppose what I would say is this. I do think conceptually there is a difference between, say, someone who's previously worked as a journalist, earning a little extra money penning articles or book reviews. If you look back to the 70s, 80s and 90s, on the Labour side, two very good examples would be Gerald Kaufman and Roy Hattersley. Now, as far as I know, they were both very, very, very committed constituency members of parliament. Certainly I knew Gerald and he was, and I have no reason to think that Roy was not. But, you know, they were gifted in the use of the pen and they would write articles and they were no doubt paid for them. I think there's a difference between that and someone who is acting as a consultant to or lobbyist for a company who is entitled under existing rules to be a consultant or advisor, although not entitled to engage in paid advocacy. But I do think those roles are pregnant with peril. And if the House wanted to move away from that and say, well, look, you know, it's perfectly legitimate for someone who wants to practice a few hours a week as a GP to do so, or as a dentist, or to do odd bits of legal work, or to pen newspaper articles, but we're not going to allow members of Parliament to be directors of or consultants to companies with a view then to seeking to use House of Commons facilities on their behalf. We could do that. We could resolve to make that change and it wouldn't be that difficult. What I think a lot of people find unattractive and perhaps even obnoxious is the idea that someone might spend a very large number of hours doing something other than his or her main job. Now, this week, as you know, the case of Jeffrey Cox has been all over the media, but I'm not actually going to refer to that. I'm going to give you another example, Andrew. I remember once sitting at lunch with a senior Conservative Member of Parliament, and I asked him whether he was going to speak on a particular subject. He was a very good speaker and a very frequent contributor. And he said, regrettably not, John. He said, I won't be around at that point. And I said, oh, why is that? And he said he was going to be working on a legal case in the north of England that would be away for a few weeks. And I remember saying to him, oh, I see, do you tend to ask the whips for permission to be absent when you're undertaking such cases? And he said, my dear John, I don't ask the whips for permission to be absent. I inform the whips of my availability and indeed therefore by implication of my non-availability. And I am conducting quite a serious case in the north of England, which will probably last some weeks. And I remember saying to him, what do you think your constituents would think if they knew that you were absenting yourself from your main role to which they've elected you as an MP to go off and earn money doing a legal case? And he said, well, that is a most interesting question, my dear John, but it is a hypothetical question because I think I can safely say that none of my constituents is aware of my imminent departure for the said case and certainly I've received no communication about it. Well, I mean, that was a sort of six-form debating society response to my challenge.
But the serious point stood that, to be honest, it was extremely arrogant of him, in my opinion, to think that it was fine for him just to swan off for several weeks, do nothing or next to nothing by way of constituency work, and certainly nothing by way of chamber representation of his patch, in order to coin it elsewhere. And I think a lot of people would say, up with this, as Churchill might have observed, we will not put. Yeah, I think Geoffrey Cox's constituents are now well aware of the fact that he has been in the I, Caribbean. I think that is a safe bet. Indeed, on uh, on social media this afternoon were were um, were pictures of posters that have been put up across his Devon constituency of ones here, it's a picture of Geoffrey Cox and underneath, missing in action, wanted dead or alive. So I got a feeling uh, when he said that this is uh, going to be a matter on which his constituents will uh, pass judgment. I suspect that this is going to be a very big issue in his next election campaign. Um, and uh, my own story, just to. Uh, uh, to uh, match yours. As I remember 10 or 15 years ago now, one elderly Labour MP who wasn't renowned for his attention to his constituents and was complaining he was going to have to go up and do um, a constituency weekend. And I said, oh, how often do you go and do them? And he said, oh, as, as little as I can get away with it, said, but every other month if, uh, is, is my aim. I said, every other month, I said. I said, I thought most MPs now did them every, every weekend or every second weekend. He said, no, Andrew, you, no, where I am, they think that that's attentive. My predecessor used to go up there twice a year. So, so clearly things have changed a lot in terms of the expectations of MPs over the last generation. Making a point, actually, when we think things have always, uh, you know, uh, going to the dogs and are getting worse, I think in terms of the attention that most MPs pay to their constituencies and the hours they put in the chamber, I mean, under you, the House of Commons started meeting earlier, it didn't used to meet until the late afternoon because of all these people who are in the city and at the bar, it now meets, what, on three days a week at lunchtime or in the mornings and so on. I think we have now got to the stage where what would have been regarded as an outrageous concept generation ago of the full-time MP is now, people now think it should be the norm. I think that's yeah. it. No. And in interestingly, Andrew, you know, I remember once, I think, invoking probably rather pompously the name Edmund Burke in a speech in Parliament. It must have been in the 97 to 2001 Parliament because Tony Benn came up to me afterwards and he said, John, I wouldn't overdo the invocation of Burke, who, of course, had been a member of Parliament for Bristol. He said, I must say to you, John, in all candour, Burke's visits to the Bristol constituency were very much by way of being an annual pilgrimage. He would come to the constituency and the red carpet would be rolled out and the Lord Mayor would turn up to greet him and he'd go to the office of the council house, which was effectively the town hall. The great luncheon would be staged and Mr Burke would orate and he would be suitably applauded and thanked and then he'd make his way back to London and the whole ceremony or episode, the whole performance would be repeated a year later. You know, I remember once going, Andrew, on a visit to the West Bank and Gaza with the now late Shirley Williams. And I remember Shirley telling me that when she started as a member of parliament, I think in 1964 in Hitchin, she didn't stage surgeries. As you know, she was always regarded as an extremely personable individual and quite a charismatic politician, very much a people person. And I looked rather shocked and she said to me, John, you look shocked, but I must tell you that was very much in keeping with the traditions of the time. The notion of the constituency surgery had not really at that point arrived. And I said, I, I understand. And then she said, but I did answer my constituents' letters, to which I immediately and probably rather sharply replied, well, I'm very glad to hear it. And she said, well, you say that, John. She said, when I was elected first, I shared an office with an ex-minor who had effectively been given a nearby safe Labour seat for the remainder of his working life as the MP. And she said, one day I saw him throwing letters in the bin. And I said, you know, you really shouldn't do that. Those constituents of yours need your help. To which he replied, nay, lass, if it's urgent, they'll send telegram. <laughs> and that yes, was the and I think there were members on both sides of the House, frankly, who were simply not diligent. And certainly, as you know, Andrew, I think we both know, having known members of Parliament over decades, 
Members of Parliament didn't used to live in their constituencies as a matter of course, or even necessarily own a home there. I remember in relation to your hero, and to a considerable extent, somebody that I very much admire, Roy Jenkins. I think Roy, in his autobiography, said that when he was first the member for Birmingham Stetchford, he would either stay in the Midland Hotel or with local friends, constituents, where he would sort of, in a sense, lodge. But he very much lived in Ladbrook Grove. And I don't think that it would even have occurred to Roy to live in Stetchford. And similarly, I think the same was true of Barbara Castle, who would often stay overnight in a hotel in Blackburn. Uh, forgive me if I'm doing her a disservice. But I don't think Barbara in any real sense lived in Blackburn. Whereas today, I think very, very, very large numbers of members of Parliament, the overwhelming majority of members of Parliament, most certainly have a home in their constituencies. And depending upon their family circumstances and their history, so to speak, many of them would say we live more than half the time in our constituencies. That didn't used to be the case. So amongst all the criticisms, and there's much pejorative that can be said about politicians, there is much good as well. And you know, I saw it as part of my role to stand up for members of parliament when I unfairly attacked. So alongside the perfectly justified sense of fury and outrage, in my view, at the government's utterly inept handling of these matters in recent times, there should be a recognition that most MPs are working hard for the public good as they see it. For glass half empty when it comes to standards and public life. If we yeah. move on to Europe and Brexit, it's very hard to see the half full glass, isn't it? I think for those of us who are pro-Europeans, you mentioned Roy Jenkins is in my, many ways my great hero and uh, the politician above all that I've admired. If you had said to Roy, who died um, 18 years ago, that uh, uh, within 15 years of his death, a referendum would be won on the cause of leaving the European Union when his last great discussions with his great friend Tony Blair were on when Britain was going to go into the Euro, he would have been shocked, depressed, and I think uh, uh, would have regarded it as a cataclysmic turn of events. You were speaker during the whole of this descent from Brexit through to essentially withdrawal from the European Union, and you saw it as a kind of bear pit in the House of Commons in what I think must have been one of the most fraught periods of modern parliamentary history, partly because the issue was so great, partly because the great majority of, of MPs, including actually a, a substantial number of Conservatives, really did think that this was um, a, 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 a fake, both a fateful and a wrong move. And partly, of course, because there was a government for a large part of this time that didn't have a majority. As you look back on it, what are your reflections? Do you look back on it with just a sense of unmitigated gloom? Or can you see seeds of how we might rebuild the European cause and a new pro-European politics from the experience of what happened after 2016? Well, as you say, it is very hard at the moment to see a glass half full or half empty. At the moment, for those of us who believe, as I do and I know you do, that Brexit is the most colossal foreign policy blunder of the post-war period, it is an unmitigated disaster, and I don't think there's any qualification of that. How do I look back on it? I suppose I look back on it and say I think there were a number of key mistakes. I think David Cameron can't help himself for all his ability, his fluency, his dexterity on his feet, and for all that he thought of himself, apparently, as heir to Blair, he's a very, very, very down market imitation of Tony Blair, because Tony Blair, as you know, was extremely strategic. He and Gordon and Peter Mandelson and Alison Campbell and others thought everything through, and you, I'm sure, in very, very, very great detail and stress tested every policy and considered all the potential consequences, upsides, downsides, possibility of unintended consequences and the rest. And I don't think David Cameron did that. David Cameron tended to fly by the seat of his pants, to trust to his natural sort of mental and oratorical agility. 
and to think that it would probably be all right on the night. He also became, in a sense, hubristic and complacent because generally he ran ahead of his party. He thought, well, you know, when the referendum comes, he would win. And when somebody said to him, well, you know, why do you think so? If you remember rightly, as I do, his response was, well, I always do. Where did he go wrong? Well, he went wrong in that he unnecessarily caved in to backbench and UKIP pressure, which could perfectly well have been resisted. He came to persuade himself that in the name of tactically outflanking UKIP and pacifying his belligerent hordes of Eurosceptic backbenchers, he would commit to a referendum, he'd win the referendum and the issue would be put to bed. Indeed, there is even a view that says, not everybody agrees with this, but there's even a view that says, Andrew, that he never really intended to hold the referendum because he said that there would be a referendum in the event of the return of a majority Conservative government. Now, my hunch is that he was probably much happier, depending upon Nick Clegg, and very sensibly so, than depending upon Bill Cash. Moreover, I think that if you look at the polls for large parts of the 2010 to 15 Parliament, they didn't suggest that he was going to get another majority or get a majority. In other words, the likelihood was that there would be a continued coalition with the Lib Dems and he would then be able easily to elide out of that commitment by saying, well, actually, the terms of the commitment will be a majority Conservative government. We haven't got one. The Lib Dems won't let me. We can't have a referendum. But the fact is he made the commitment and he got the victory, and he was then committed to hold the referendum. And that, I think, was a grievous mistake. There was no need to have a referendum. And I may sound elitist in saying this, but I'm one of those people who thinks that there isn't a particularly good reason to hold a referendum on a matter to which there is much detail and complexity, and the government could perfectly well not have conducted it. So that, I think, was... The first mistake. The second mistake was that the government not only hadn't campaigned in favour of British membership over a period of many years, but continued thereafter not really to do so. It just waged a completely negative scare campaign, which, if anything, was counterproductive. So those were two major errors. And then when you got into the detail of how to grapple with Brexit, I think the biggest overall failures were these. First, the government clearly hadn't remotely made up its mind what Brexit meant. So you went from June 2016 to July 2018, two years before the issue of a government white paper on the subject. There were huge differences at the heart of government as to what they wanted from Brexit. And I think the other mistake, which was across Parliament was that people wouldn't compromise, they wouldn't vote for any option when we got to those indicative votes other than their own. Actually, Andrew, Parliament came pretty close, not close enough, but pretty close to supporting a second referendum. But I know people who said, I don't want a second referendum, I want a soft Brexit, I want membership of the single market or of the customs union and I'll vote for such an option but I won't vote for a second referendum and, and then there were people who just opposed to referenda so they said they wouldn't vote for it. If the House had agreed it didn't want this, I did float this to, to colleagues but I got the impression they didn't want it. If colleagues had wanted an exhaustive process whereby as a result of those indicative votes do we have single market, do we have EEA, do we have customs union type Brexit, i.e. a very, very, very minor Brexit, do we have a second referendum? If there'd been a system which forced the House to arrive at a choice of one of those alternatives, that might have led to a different result. Instead, of course, everything was voted down. And here there's a kind of eerie parallel between Brexit and if you go back to, I think, 2007, votes on House of Lords reform, when everything was voted down, every option for reform, however many votes it got, was defeated. And therefore, those who wanted to do absolutely nothing and keep things exactly as they were, won the day. And in the case of Brexit, all the alternatives were rejected. And 
And it was another a final failure, I would mention, I mean, all sorts of mistakes made by Boris Johnson and saying there wouldn't be a border in the Irish Sea when that's exactly what he's created, saying there wouldn't be additional paperwork when he knew there would be and there is and there will be. I think that Theresa May, fundamentally a decent and honest person, was guilty of a chronic, lamentable, unforgivable failure of imagination, brackets, lack thereof, close brackets, after the 2017 election. I mean, she behaved as though nothing had happened. Good morning, a bit disappointed not to win, having discussions with the Democratic Unionist Party, further announcement to be made in due course. Further announcement to be made in due course. There is an agreement with the Democratic Unionist Party, government continues as before. I mean, Andrew, it was surreal. It never appeared to occur to the right honourable lady, the member for Maidenhead, that she called an election to boost her majority. She had an election in which she lost her majority and had none at all. And that might just conceivably be the occasion for reaching across the house and saying, with a Brexit, but instead of which, she just doubled down and said, well, I'm gonna go for my approach. And she went for her approach, she failed. And then the Tory party lurched rightwards to frankly an even more disastrous position and i cannot see i'm very happy to be proved wrong over a period if i am i cannot see any upside to the act of industrial self-harm that we have committed over the last five years the evidence of it is all around us at the moment the government is able to hide behind and take cover under the impact of the pandemic but lots of the problems that we're experiencing here with supply chains and shortages of HGV drivers and absence of essential foodstuffs on our supermarket shelves are not problems that are being experienced at all or on anything like the same scale elsewhere in Europe. And the clue is in that simple word that begins with B and ends in T. And the word is Brexit, and the deed is Brexit, and the consequence of Brexit is being experienced by people every day. And there's not the slightest sign that that is going to be minimised or diminished at all, and certainly not any time soon. I think it's worth looking at the history a bit more, because it's very important that myths don't take hold, which will have great significance in the future. And one of the myths, I think, is that... Um, after the 2016 referendum, even though it was a narrow vote, it was a done deal that Brexit would happen and it would have been profoundly undemocratic if it hadn't proceeded. That is not my view. My view is that a second referendum on the terms of Brexit, when people could actually see what was on offer, what it would mean, how it compared with all of the things that were said on both sides in 2016, was a profoundly democratic thing to do. And it's in accord with what many other countries have done when faced with similar uh, similarly huge national decisions. You referred to um, Theresa May, the Maybot, and I don't think anyone thinks that she covered herself in glory. I think it's also fair to say Jeremy Corbyn didn't cover himself in glory either. And uh, on the Labour side, I engaged in many arguments with him and his people about why they should support the second referendum. It's my view that if Jeremy had supported the second referendum and the Labour front bench had come on side, and they had made clear that the big issue that was going to go to the people wasn't the future of the government, where, of course, the Jeremy Corbyn-led government was never going to appeal to the centre ground, but whether or not uh, the Theresa May stroke Boris Johnson Brexit should proceed, that there would have been a second referendum and we probably would have won it. You were there and you saw it all. What do you think? I think it would have helped if the Labour Party had come out explicitly in favour of a second referendum. I think it was obvious that Jeremy was extremely unenthusiastic about it. I mean, he had historically been, of course, a Euro sceptic. He had declared himself in favour of continued membership and said that he would vote to remain. But I think it's common knowledge that, you know, he was more a spectator during the referendum than not. And I think people could see that the Labour Party's trumpet gave off an uncertain sound. And if the trumpet gives off an uncertain sound, who shall follow? 
as the saying goes. So I think it could have made a difference if there had been a very robust, determined, relentless, persistent, indefatigable campaign on the opposition's part for a second referendum. And of course, that wasn't the case. And Labour MPs tended to divide into groups. And it wasn't necessarily left right. It was to some degree based on people's perception of their own constituencies. And look, each individual MP must be free to make a judgment for him or her self. But I think that there was too much focus, to be honest, on, oh, well, in this part of the world, they're pro-Brexit, so we better support Brexit. Quite a lot of the people who were strongly pro-Brexit in some of those Labour seats were people who were frankly not minded to vote Labour anyway. And I think that if Labour had taken a very clear principled stance, it would have reached out to a large share of the population and the major opposition, the principal opposition would have been saying, this is what we think should happen. Now, I mustn't rewrite history, Andrew. I heard what you said in your question that you always felt that it was perfectly reasonable to have two referenda not one referendum. That wasn't privately my view. I mean, as Speaker, I didn't have a view at all. I was just trying to facilitate the House and allow the House to vote on different options. And I took the view, as you know, that the House should have its say and have its way. But privately, you know, did I think at the time of the 2016 referendum that there would be two? I must admit I didn't because nobody suggested that. The attitude was, well, you know, this is not legally binding, but a politically binding referendum. However, I think my feeling is that these situations are not set in aspect, they're not cast in stone. And what you could see over a period was a notable change. And sometimes Brexiteers behave as though this didn't happen. The difference between the referendum in 2016 and the House making decisions in 2018 and 19 was called the general election of 2017, which Theresa May called with a view to getting a sizable majority to deliver her version of Brexit, but she didn't get it. And so the government had no majority and Labour's number of seats went up sharply. So I personally believe at that point, those opposed to Brexit were perfectly entitled to say well, let's look at it again and let's see what's produced. And after that 2017 election, and this is the extraordinary feature of this, which I invite your members to think about, it took, after that 2017 election, another 13 months for the government to come forward with a white paper. So even within government, the government that had conducted the referendum, and a goodly number of the survivors of which were Brexiteers, in 2018, hadn't decided what Brexit meant. You had those within government who apparently wanted a soft Brexit, customs unions, single market access, and so on, and those who thought that there should be a hard Brexit. They took ages. I mean, David Davis is somebody I've known for 35 years, and despite our differences on some issues, I've long respected David, and I still do. I think he's an interesting politician who sometimes takes, you know, an idiosyncratic and certainly an independent view, but as you will recall, after 19 years on the back benches, he was, he says, unexpectedly recalled to government as Brexit secretary. Andrew, sitting in the chair, I remember him coming just after the referendum to the House to make a statement on Brexit. And it was extraordinary because David is an intelligent guy, but he basically made a statement saying that the government's approach would be informed by considerations of doing what was right in the national interest. And he set out of a series of principles in his statement, and that was one of the principles. And I thought, well, that's bizarre. That's bizarre. It's bizarre in the extreme. It's extraordinarily vague. It would be even more bizarre if he'd come to the House and said, I must say to the House that a key principle that will guide us in our approach to Brexit is that we will seek to do what is not in the national interest. I mean, that's how vacuous it was and at the end of that statement and david performed with some elan he didn't seem at all embarrassed about it but it was desperately vague at the end of that statement there were two things that were said that were very significant 
One was Ken Clark getting up and in his gentlemanly and slightly laconic, amusing way, saying, I don't know if welcome. I'm sorry, I don't know if welcome. My right honourable friends, intention to go away. Spend a little amount of time reflecting on this matter, but he'll come back to the house when he's got some idea of what Brexit actually means. So that was Ken, in a sense, in a good natured way, pouring cold water on the statement that David had just issued. And there was a Scottish National Party spokesperson called Stephen Gethins, who called out with split second timing when David Davis sat down after making this statement. Is that it? That's what Stephen said. Is that it? In other words, you wanted the referendum. You, David, were a Brexiteer. You've just won it. And you come to the House and make an extraordinarily vacuous statement. And I think that, you know, it could have been, it could have been so different. And the more I saw what a mess it was and the imbroglio in which the government found itself, as a result of its own failures, its own indecision, its own lack of clarity and sense of unreality, the more I thought, well, it seems to me that Parliament would be perfectly entitled to say, let's look at this matter again. The person who put it, I suppose, most powerfully was Tony Blair when he said, well, look, you know, there's been a vote for departure, but there's not been a vote for a destination. I just had a text message asking you what I think may be the most important question of the evening, John. Is your Boris Johnson impersonation as good as your Ken Clark and your Tony Benn? And while you're thinking of whether you want to share Boris Johnson with us, as it were, uh, let me put my last question to you before I open it up to our, uh, our audience. How long do you think Boris Johnson's political life expectancy is? Well, can I, can I, can I, can I, can I say, can I, can, well, uh, 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 Andrew, uh, very, 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 very good of you, very good of you, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, characteristically, characteristically, uh, 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 generous, generous, uh, generous, to a, generous, generous to a fault uh, of you to, to, to uh, ask me that uh, question. I think it's longer than people think and longer than people want. I have a very simple view about the Prime Minister. I think he's an extremely good campaigner and I think he's an extremely bad Prime Minister. And those two things are not in any sense mutually exclusive. I think that's obvious. He is skilled at moving public opinion, winning people to his cause, persuading people to give him a chance. And he demonstrated that, of course, in his mayoral campaign, but he most certainly demonstrated it in 2019. I think get Brexit done was a very, very, very simplistic slogan. And actually, only the first part of it has been got done in the sense that an agreement, trade and cooperation agreement, a withdrawal agreement and trade and cooperation agreement were passed, but there's still much detail in so many sectors to be worked out and all sorts of consequences flowing that couldn't be predicted and haven't been managed and detriments that are yet to be overcome if they ever will be. So I don't think Brexit has been sorted in any proper sense at all. But he put that simple proposition, let's get Brexit done, and people went with him. He does have a kind of roller coaster approach to politics, whereby, you know, he gets into a mess and flannels and tries to get himself out of it as quickly as he can, and then to shift the agenda. But I think if people think, oh, well, the pack of cards is going to collapse a week next Tuesday, they're much mistaken. I think that it will take time. I think it will be cumulative. I think eventually people will say there is really something rotten taking place. There. Now, people might say, well, the debacle over the standard system could be a turning point. Well, it could be. It's too early, I think, to say. The contrast with the 1990s and the fallout from John Major's Back to Basics campaign and the slew of scandals, the contrast with that is that that was a slew. In fact, it was almost a hurricane that occurred in a relatively short period, affecting a significant number of members of Parliament. We're not yet in that situation, and I don't know, I can't predict whether we will be. And so I'm not sure it's yet as 
damaging. It's further away from a possible election than John Major was in in 1995. Not dramatically further away, but a bit further away. On the other hand, everybody regarded John Major himself as a person of bravery and integrity, which he was. And that certainly can't be said of the current Prime Minister. So, you know, he does have some difficulties on his hands. But I think there is one difference, and I'm sorry to have to say this. Tony Blair's Labour Party had become a formidable opposition. That was a veritable machine. It was well-oiled, it was well-funded, it was well-operated, and it was on a very good footing, really, from the moment that Tony Blair became leader of the opposition in what, June 1994, and certainly by 1995 and six, you know, all the polls were suggesting that Labour was going to win and potentially to win very big, as indeed transpired. Today, Labour's in nothing like a strong opposition. Now, I don't wish to be unfair in any way to Keir Starmer, who's a highly intelligent person and who's come into public life for all the right reasons. But clearly, you only have to look at the polls to see that there's much, much, much more to be done if Labour is to cut through. Now, the period of the pandemic in particular was deeply wounding to the country as a whole. Politically, it was especially unhelpful to the opposition because the government was all over the airwaves every day. There's a proportion of the public that feel that they should rally behind the government in a crisis. The prime minister had a near-death experience. And the cumulative significance of all of those things was that the Conservatives were likely to remain in the ascendant, rather sharply so. And that has proved to be the case. So Labour has got to bring about a step change in the quality of its campaigning and the forcefulness of its advocacy. It's got to develop a narrative so that six months, nine months, 12 months from now, you can go out into a street and ask 100 people, what does Labour stand for? And people will be able to tell you. I don't think at the moment that's so. In fact, I think I can say with complete confidence at the moment, that's not so. Somebody asked me at a business conference the other day when I was busily indulging in coruscating criticism of the Prime Minister, who do I think would make a better Prime Minister? And I said, oh, Keir Starmer. I think Keir Starmer would make a better Prime Minister than Boris Johnson. But politics is about competing alternatives and the power of persuasion. And as things stand, Keir and Labour have not persuaded the public that Keir and Labour are to be preferred. That's their challenge. Well, uh, on that slightly depressing note, let's uh, proceed uh, to questions. And there's a wide variety of questions. I'll pick them out as ones I think that might just be interesting. And one or two left field ones, too, including the first one from Rachel, uh, who asks, do governments ever take notice of protests? And what do we have to do to put this right? And I think probably Rachel's thinking of those two huge people's vote marches, a million people in London twice. But that didn't actually sway Parliament. And to all of our activists who are very keen to make a difference, we have 120 European movement branches, they're out there with their street stalls, they get their petitions going, they organise coaches for those big demos, and there's a sense of deflation when Brexit then went through and they weren't able to make their voice heard as, as they saw it. What advice have you got for them, John? I often used to say to MPs, Andrew, if they asked me, how could they pursue an issue more effectively with government? And I would tend to say, well, go to the table office, put down a question, consider the opportunities to air the subject in debates in the chamber, et cetera, et cetera. And I would tend to say, persist, persist, persist. You've just got to keep at it. Campaigning is about quantity, persistence, and above all, repetition. In other words, you know, it's not like some sort of intellectual debate in which, at least in theory, you may tell me if it's not this way in academe, Andrew, but at least in theory, if you can show your opponent in an academic argument that he or she is guilty of an intellectual error, under the rules of academic discourse, that person is really obliged to acknowledge the point and to go away and reconsider his or her thesis, making suitable adjustments and so on. Politics isn't like that. People are making the same arguments over and over and over again and you have to find new ways to articulate them in the light, Rachel, of emerging evidence. When you say, you know, with almost 
audible frustration do governments ever take notice of protests. I mean, I think they do. To be fair, the difficulty in the case of those massive anti-Brexit demonstrations, and yes, they were massive, is that the government, completely determined to persist, was inclined always to say, yeah, they're big demonstrations, but the biggest demonstration of all, of public opinion, came in the referendum. Now, you know, you might almost be shaking your head as I say that, but I'm not saying that I agree with the government about that, but that was the government's response. And it was often articulated in the chamber if a Labour MP or a Lib Dem MP got up and referred to those demonstrations. You know, you could hear Tory MPs chuntering from a sedentary position, which, as you know, the Speaker deprecates, that you could hear people chuntering from a sedentary position, 17 million, 17 million, 17 million. And, you know, I remember just after I left office, I tend to meet a lot of very friendly people in London where I live, but I remember I was just walking towards my agent's office and some bloke, who was obviously a Brexiteer, walked past me. He said, 17 million people, mate. Good job your time's up. And I, you know, I didn't bother to argue with him. It's actually a very rare experience of mine in London. But there aren't 17 million. the answer is that they can make a difference. The poll tax protests made a difference. Don't be under any illusions about that. I think what you've got to do, and, and here, if I may, yeah. I'd like to add a dissenting note. I think what you've got to do is to continue to focus on the issue. I totally understand why Keir Starmer, as leader of the opposition, is saying, look, Brexit is done. That's an issue that's been addressed. And the Labour Party is much broader than an anti-Brexit movement. We've accepted the verdict. We're moving on. We're crafting a new agenda. I understand that. And I understand politically the importance in his mind of not wanting to be thought to be campaigning and not campaigning for immediate or even early re-entry to the European Union. But I think it would be a grave mistake, almost a cardinal sin, to eschew discussion of Brexit because it's all around us. It's in front of us. It's dripping over us. It's contaminating the body politic. It's impacting on living standards. It's going to cause a shakeout of jobs. It's denying people services that they need. It's wreaking havoc. So the idea that we can look away and say, well, we're not going to talk about Brexit. It's not going to make a problem. That, I think, is unrealistic. There's got to be a balance here. And part of the balance must mean and entail pointing to the manifold failures of Brexit, the disruption, the price rises, the bureaucracy, the damage to business, the loss of jobs, the deterioration in our global standing, and all the rest of it. These are facts with which we have to reckon. Now, you know, we talked a little bit, Andrew, we touched on the subject of Roy Jenkins, you know, somebody who really believed in the European ideal. And I think I mentioned my friend and probably yours, Ken Clark, someone who's a, a long time Europhile. My attitude for what it's worth is not that of someone who's ever had a sort of romantic attachment to the European idea in a way that I respect it, that many, perhaps most, perhaps all members of the European movement do. My attitude, in the end, came to change on this subject, my private attitude to Brexit, to the European Union, on the basis of a hard-headed calculation of the British national interest. It's not that I'm sort of a fanatical Europhile. It's more that I just thought, well, this is the largest trade block next to us makes more sense to be part of it than to remove ourselves from it and this is the largest power block of which we're part it makes more sense to be part of it than to remove ourselves from it and it just seems to me so blindingly obvious that there isn't a palpable upside to brexit and the downsides are raining down on us like a snowstorm. The, uh, Europe, the European movement certainly isn't guilty of ignoring Brexit. We sort of regard ourselves as the uh, conscience of the nation and constantly uh, drawing people's attention to it. Yeah, no, no, but, sorry, I, I, yes. We, so, we are where we are. I, and... Yeah, I'm, I certainly mustn't give the impression that I'm suggesting the European movement. No, no, I, was, I, I wasn't for a moment yeah. suggesting that you were. I was just uh, doing a, a bit of a plug for all of my uh, 
friends who are in, in this meeting at the moment who are uh, many of them really you know uh, slogging in a really serious way to uh, uh, to keep the campaigns going but we are where we are we are out and it's going to be a massive ordeal to get back in again the european movement's slogan and strategy is step by step towards rejoin and um jackie mercer has a question uh, in the chat um uh, do we know what Keir Starmer really wants, really, the EU? So what does he see as the goal? Do you think he shares that goal? And Sharon Edwards has a question. What are the next steps towards rejoin? So if you were acting as a kind of consultant to the European movement at the moment, you know, not, not being paid large sums by one of your corporate uh, sponsors now that you're no longer Mr. Speaker, but giving us your, your frank and honest advice, given that it is clearly going to be an audio. Nobody thinks that we could, are going to, in any in, in immediate future, going to be rejoining the EU. If our strategy is right on campaign, campaigning step by step towards rejoin, what do you think our next steps should be? We're at the moment campaigning on Brexit isn't working, and I think persuading the public uh, I don't know if they need much persuading at the moment, judging by the polls, which shows 60 to 70 percent of them are clearly of the view that Brexit was a mistake, but getting that firmly lodged in the public mind. But then the question is, what are you going to do about it? And what would you also suggest in response to Jackie? We advise Keir that he should be uh, proposing at the next election, given that, of course, he also wants to win it. What would, what would your thoughts be on the next steps to rejoin and how we should pace ourselves? Well, first of all, I think you can't ignore facts, you have to face them. So when it is clear that a particular problem either derives from or is demonstrably exacerbated by Brexit, let's say so. So when, for example, we see that there is a shortage of HUV drivers, and it is pretty obvious to us that that is a Brexit consequence, I think we've got to say so, because that is having a damaging effect on what is available, in some cases by way of services, and certainly of goods for the public to buy. If there are shortages on the shelves, and they are the result of Brexit, it would be absurd for us to allow the government to occupy the field, the doctrine of the occupied field, with some other and completely fallacious explanation, like, you know, it's a, a COVID consequence. If it isn't a COVID consequence, if we've done the research and we know the facts and it's clear that it's a Brexit consequence, then I don't think we should tire of saying so repeatedly over and over and over again. And if people say, oh, well, you know, you're trying to reverse Brexit. No, as a democratic representative or as a campaigning organisation, what we're trying to do is to point out the facts rather than to hide them or to obscure them or to deny them. So I think that the European movement should identify all the examples, preferably in a publication sooner rather than later, of negative consequences that flow either exclusively or largely from Brexit or have been exacerbated by Brexit. And I think it is something that should be repeated on a regular basis because it is probably the biggest single fact that is influencing the state of economy at the moment and people's living standards and personal convenience or inconvenience. Secondly, I think that as the Labour Party approaches the election and other parties that are worried about these corrosive effects of Brexit, what people who think like that should be doing is thinking what in a rather British pragmatic way can we advocate would at least in the short term serve as a palliative for Brexit and allow us to avoid its more egregious consequences. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, take something like the Erasmus programme. Presumably, if we think that that's a good programme, we ought to be clamouring for that. If we think that we're losing out in relation to your atom. Well, you know, why not say so? So those institutional arrangements of which we were previously part and are not now part and are being damaged by not being part of them should be flagged up. 
And I don't think that that amounts to saying we are proposing to launch a bid a week next Tuesday or two years next Tuesday to rejoin the European Union. What it means is we're saying these are things which could be remedied, which could be reversed. We could opt back into some of these programmes from which there would be real benefits if the European Union would allow us to do so. And the government's not going to advocate that because it will upset the swivel eye tendency on their benches, the extremists. But sensible, mainstream, moderate, constructive politicians on the opposition benches are going to advocate those things. Now, as to Jackie's question, do we know what Keir Starmer really wants? I don't say this in any spirit of discourtesy. I must admit I don't know because I don't know Keir well personally. When I saw him perform in his role as shadow Brexit secretary, he struck me as very, very clinical, forensic, and focused on the detail, the minutiae, the interstices of the arrangements. And did I form a very clear view that Keir Starmer was a pro-European? Yes, I did. Uh, do I think he's happy about Brexit? No, I didn't think so for one moment. Quite what he thinks is a realistic prospectus next time round, I don't know. But at the risk of you accusing me, Jackie Mercer, of a shameful cop-out from your question, I think I'm inclined to say, I don't know, but I know a man who does. And that person is the Right Honourable Gentleman, the member for Hoban and St Pancras, the leader of the opposition, Sir Keir Starmer. And that segues into my advisory role, my first gambit in dealing with my superior, the noble Lord, the Lord Adonis. And it's to say to the noble Lord, the Lord Adonis, the next person who you should be inviting to address a gathering of the European movement, either virtually or for real, is Sir Keir Starmer. And Jackie then, then come beetling along to that meeting and she can pose that self the same question, which I think you can probably extract a commitment from Andrew Adonis tonight to enable you, Jackie, to do. I have to do just that. I think that's an excellent suggestion. Um, if I could move us back to the political uh, situation and the political system, because there's some interest amongst um, friends in this meeting on what we can do to reform it. Several people have asked about electoral reform. Sandra Laws asks, how can we reform our electoral process to ensure fair representation, which does not happen with first past the post. Now, you and I, John, I don't recall that we've ever had a conversation about electoral reform. I haven't the faintest idea what your view is. Do you think that uh, some more proportional system is a good idea, or do you think that anything that moves away from the single member constituency, you were the member for Buckingham for how many years? 20 years? 22 years. 22 years. Do you think that that should be sacrosanct? What, what's your view? No, I don't think it should be sacrosanct. I mean, do I have a history of support for electoral reform? I don't. For a long time, you know, I probably stuck in my lager and tended to subscribe to the traditional view of supporters of first past the post system that it was a better facilitator, almost a guarantor, but I emphasize almost, of a clear result in strong government. That, of course, wasn't the case in 2010, and it wasn't the case in 2017. The one consistent thread in my otherwise rather inconsistent attitude, which has been moving more towards electoral reform, is that really from about 2005 onwards, when Tony Blair got back with a majority of 66 on the strength, I think, of only about 35.2% of the vote, has been that I have felt that the longer governments could get elected with relatively small shares of the overall vote, the more the clamour for electoral reform would grow. Now, the position has been very mixed because, of course, in 2017, the third party was getting a, a very small share of the vote and it was very much a, a Labour versus Conservative battle. And if I remember rightly, I think each of them had 40% of the vote or just over, thereabouts. So, I'm not sure if Labour had 40%, but pretty close. 
So, you know, they've not necessarily been as low as 35 or 36%. They've sometimes been a bit higher. But one consistent feature has been that a political party with not much more than 40% of the vote has got a much larger share of the seats than that. And I have increasingly come to the view that it would be fairer if we had a system in which the way people voted was reflected in the composition of the House. Now, at the moment, as I say, that's not the case. If you had a single transferable vote system, it would produce something like a mirror image of how people voted. So I myself think there's a case for it. And of course, if you believe it, if Dildridge 68, who's put a question on this matter or has got one up in the private chat, wants that, and if other people want that, well, then of course they should campaign for it. The truth is it's not going to happen anytime soon because the government obviously has absolutely no interest in electoral reform whatsoever. What alternative is there if you want to get rid of what is fundamentally a reactionary government to give a progressive government instead? Well, you may have to consider deals and alliances between progressives. And, you know, at the moment, those don't exist, but maybe they should. I mean, the reality is, of course, that Labour and Liberal Democrats both regard themselves justifiably as major national parties, obviously Labour vastly bigger, and they feel they must stand in every constituency. But let's face it, there are some constituencies which Labour has no chance of winning, and very significant numbers of constituencies the Liberal Democrats have no chance of winning, if there were some sort of formal or informal understanding between them, you know, it is possible that they might be able to shift the tectonic plates and get rid of this government. It's often said that there's an anti-Labour majority in the country. Well, no doubt that's true. But the converse of that is that there is assuredly an anti-Conservative majority in the country. There are a lot of people of progressive faith, and at the moment, their allegiances are divided between a kind of licorice all sorts of competing alternatives to the Conservatives. And meanwhile, in case you didn't know or haven't noticed or didn't consider it, the Conservatives are laughing their heads off. I think that leads um, very um, well onto the issue of the relationship between this potential progressive alliance, the opposition parties coming together, and cooperation on the European issue, because the European movement actually historically it was founded by Winston Churchill and was, I think, probably a predominantly conservative movement in the 50s and 60s. And of course, we have a lot of conservatives who are engaged. Our president is Lord Heseltine, and you're very welcome to do an impersonation of him in a moment too, John. Uh, my predecessor was Stephen Dorrell, another a distinguished former Conservative cabinet minister, Dominic Grieve is is on our uh, on our council. We have a lot of um, uh, uh, Ken Clark, who you mentioned earlier, was one of our vice presidents. But I think it's fair to say that because of the way the Brexit has developed, uh, that our most active younger members now tend to be from the opposition parties, and it's Europe that unites them. And I often can't tell in our meetings whether the people speaking with huge passion about moving step by step towards rejoin are Labour, Lib Dem, Green, Nationalist, in some cases Conservative. And it looks to me as if, because you, you, you're not going to bring a, a progressive alliance into being and people to cooperate, unless they're cooperating around defined campaigns. They've actually got a shared agenda. We've mentioned electoral reform, but a shared commitment to taking Britain step by step towards Europe, I think is exactly the kind of of passionate cause, uh, well beyond the reaches of one party that could bring politicians together and would certainly command a lot of support from, from party members uh, in all parts of parties as well. So my party, the Labour Party, which, as you said, has been divided into factions in the recent past through its, uh, its leaders. Uh, left and right, there's broad support for Europe. So how do you think we could put this together? I think campaigning on Europe and bringing the opposition parties closer together, which is in the chat I see John Harris's uh, question. Brexit opposition, he says, remains too fragmented to drive significant change for better in the short or near term. 
what in John's opinion may catalyze a drive to change and catalyze is a very John Burko word. It is rather a John Burko word, although in this case it's a Miss Excellent John Harris word. Is that the, the one and only, the incomparable, understated, but brilliant writer I don't know whether it's a writing journalist or uh, or someone who bears the same name. I can't yes. uh, I can't inquire directly. Not sure. Okay. You know what is going to catalyze that change? I suppose. The significant thing is what's affecting people in their day to day lives. In other words, most people aren't that political and therefore a campaign driven by abstract principle or a theory or a philosophy or a vision probably doesn't quite cut it. I think what is probably needed is a coming together of people from different political parties and histories, all of whom are willing commonsensically to acknowledge to each other in a room or in a virtual room, what they can see around them as the failures of Brexit, the damage of Brexit, the inconvenience of Brexit, the cost of Brexit, the broken promises of Brexit. And that, you know, would be the starting point of a get together between the Michael Hessel Times and the Andrew Adonises and the Ed Davies and the Caroline Lucases and the Dominic Greaves and potentially the Anna Subras and Justin Greenings and so on. And is there a market out there for that view to be coordinated? You almost need a, a coordinated body of people leading perhaps a professional operation, a sponsored Brexit watch, something like that, which in a sense sets itself up in explicit opposition to the bigger faction that is dominant in the media. And I use those terms advisedly. The bigger faction that is dominant in the media is, of course, pro-Brexit. It supported Brexit, it championed Brexit, and it continues to do so. And it's not going to highlight failures of Brexit. And one thing a newspaper is never going to do, ever, is say, we were totally wrong. Please blame us. Mayor Culpa. They'll always encourage everybody else to do so, whether it be a trade union or a business organisation or a scandalised politician or a show business person or whatever. But no newspaper is ever going to say, we are to blame. But actually, a lot of them have got in a sense, political blood all over their hands because they chivied and cavilled away and argued for Brexit and brought about the prospect of the referendum and then they cheer-led for Brexit ever since. And a lot of them who got what my late father would call a lot of wool on their backs, that is to say they're prosperous plutocrats, are completely protected. They can put their money anywhere they like in the world at a moment's notice and, you know, if there's a bit of inflation or whatever, does it bother them? It doesn't affect them, Andrew, because they're operating on a scale whereby they're not going to be in any way seriously hit. It's actually the mass of ordinary people who are affected by Brexit. So I think there's something to be said for a kind of citizens get together between people from different political parties and perhaps of none. But it does need some significant leaders, including people from the past and people from the present, who will come together and say, look, we may always preserve our different party allegiances. We don't need to discuss that, but we're all agreed about one thing. There are 25 or 75 or 125 failures of Brexit, which we are going to monitor and go on and on and on and on about until we have created, if you like, a critical mass of public recognition that there's a problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, discussion of the biggest uh, issues, as Tony, Tony Ben used to say, the issues. Uh, yes, he used to say, not about personality. 
This is Lord Davis, I must say, it's not about personalities, it's about policies. But I can't resist bringing you on to some of the personalities because they're some of the most interesting things in politics. You were speaker for um, 10 years, which is one of the longest speakerships in, in recent history. Tell us, because we're all interested in, you know, what life is like in Westminster and all that. If you look at those 10 years as a whole, what would you say was your high point and what would you say was your low point? And don't hold back in giving us some, some uh, details of the personalities involved. What was the high point? Well, I completely recognise that I'm a Marmite character, Andrew, and therefore, you know, there are people who will say, well, he did a really good job. He stood up for the rights of Parliament, the status of the legislature, the capacity of MPs to fight for what they believed in individually and for the status and authority of the House of Commons institutionally. And well done him. And then there will be other people I know. Of course, my coruscating critics will say, oh, he's the worst speaker of all time. He was completely biased. He got issue after issue after issue wrong. And, you know, we never supported him and he stayed too long. And thank God he's gone. And, you know, I'm perfectly content to rest with my own record and to subject myself to a multiplicity of different verdicts. But my own feeling is that the Brexit period was a period in which I did champion the rights of the House of Commons to scrutinize the government of the day. And actually, it may not please European movement members when I say this, but I did do this consistently from 2013 onwards as Brexit grew in importance and salience as an issue. So when the Eurosceptics, as they were then called, they weren't then known as Brexiteers, the word hadn't been created, when they were champing up the bit to question and probe and scrutinise and challenge and contradict and expose what they regarded as errors of omission or commission of the government of the day, the Cameron government, I gave them their head. I selected an amendment in the name of John Barron to the Queen's speech in 2013, which was a heavily supported backbench amendment. Now, some people might have said, well, that's a very strange thing to do. I remember a senior official in the House saying to me, it's very unusual, Mr Speaker, for there to be an amendment tabled to the gracious addressed by a government backbencher. And I said, yes, it is unusual, but it's not improper. And I think it should be selected because this person does speak for a significant part of his party. And then I was selecting urgent questions from people like Bill Cash and Bernard Jenkin. And I think, to be honest, the Cameron Osborne axis in government probably found it a great pestilential nuisance that I did so. But I stand by that because the speaker's role is to give a voice to a miscellany of different forces in Parliament, including minorities within parties. The difficulty is, of course, as far as the Brexiteers are concerned, they talk about British fair play, but actually there's no such thing. There's people who believe in fair play and people who don't, whether they're British or French or German or Italian or Dutch or Belgian or whatever. And actually the Brexiteers didn't have a fair play attitude at all because once they were dominant post-referendum, and the Anna Subras, the Dominic Greaves, the Justine Greenings, were the dissidents in their party. And I started granting questions to them to challenge the government. The Brexiteers didn't like it. But actually, I do feel in that period, I was doing what the Speaker should do. And I now and again, as you know, selected amendments, much to the irritation of the government. I remember once saying to the government chief, Whip, Julian Smith, Julian, with respect, it's not for me to protect you from the absence of a government majority. If you haven't got a majority, that's your problem, mate, not mine. So I did regard that as a period in which I asserted myself, but in my view, entirely properly. And so I'm proud of that period. I'm not defensive about it. I know that Brexiteer detractors will say, oh, he was biased. He was determined to stop Brexit. No, I was determined to enable the House to decide what to do in the aftermath, not just of the referendum, but of the 2017 election and the stasis that followed. So I'm proud of that. You know, more widely, Andrew, you know, I am proud of the fact that I tried to energise and make much more topical and demanding and scrutinising the legislative branch. I took the view that MPs should not be 
craven lickspittles of the executive, they should be questioning and probing and challenging and demanding answers and looking at the detail and arguing for alternatives if they wish. And, you know, in parliamentary terms, in terms of first order issues, the issues of the chamber, the issues of the legislature, I'm very proud of that. More widely, you know, I tried to reform the place. I had two other objectives beyond energizing and invigorating and revitalizing the chamber. And those two other objectives, and the state of members of the European movement, were to modernize the house and to begin a conversation with civil society. Modernizing the house basically meant that at the end of my tenure, we had a very, very, very successful, thriving, much in demand nursery, but we had no shooting gallery, which had been closed down due to lack of demand. When I started, there was a shooting gallery, but no nursery. And I remember a senior retired clerk once saying to me, a female clerk once saying to me, Mr. Speaker, I don't know if you're aware, but throughout my 40 years service in the house, there was periodically talk of establishing a nursery that MPs and staff could pay for on the estate, but nothing ever happened. And I'm very pleased to see that you established one within 18 months of becoming Speaker. And I established, as you know, Andrew, an education centre, digital, high-tech, cutting-edge, state-of-the-art interactive education centre, which is going to allow about 100,000 school children a year to come and learn about the journey from the signing of the Magna Carta to the rights and responsibilities citizens enjoy today. And I did try to shake up the staff profile of the House by appointing the first BAME and female speakers chaplain, the first BAME and female speakers counsel, senior lawyer, uh, the first BAME sergeant at arms in the history of the House and so on. You know, and I resolved that I'd welcome the Youth Parliament every year and chair their proceedings, and I'd go to the Youth Parliament conference every year for 10 years and speak to them and be questioned by them, engage with them, spend the day with them. And, you know, I tried to practice parliamentary engagement with the public. So that was sort of in reach, you know, welcoming charities. I staged about a thousand events in Speaker's House over the years for charities, particularly focused on children, special educational needs, fight against global poverty, LGBT equality. There'd been no LGBT events in Speaker's House under previous speakers, and it seemed extraordinary. So I always welcomed in Stonewall and the Kaleidoscope Trust, the Albert Kennedy Trust, etc. You know, and I thought, well, I ought to get out and about. I don't mind telling members of the European movement, very early in my speakership, after I'd started visiting schools and universities and faith groups and public bodies, a very senior conservative member of aristocratic ilk came up to me in the chair, very polite, Andrew, but very hesitant. And he said to me, Mr. Speaker, I'm bound to say I didn't vote for you. <laughs> I thought, well, I didn't need to be Sherlock Holmes or Hercule Poirot to work out this job hadn't voted for me. He wouldn't have voted for me in a million years. He said, I didn't vote for you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I'm bound to say I voted for Sir George Young, because I think he's a bloody good egg. I think he's a bloody good egg, uh, first class man, first class man. But I, but I'm bound to say, Mr. Speaker, sir, I think you're actually doing jolly well, if I may say so. I think you're doing frightfully well. All these, all these, all these, all these urgent questions and, and, and um, bringing ministers to the box and, and so on. It's absolutely right, absolutely right thing to do. But, uh, but can I, can I, can I just make my point? And I say, yes, please do make your point. This chap's now retired from the house, by the way. And please do make your point. And he said to me, well. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm bound to say, I think this, 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 this outreach business of yours, he said, I didn't, I didn't get it. And I said, what do you mean you didn't get it? And he said, well, I think it's a rum business, rum business. Those of you in the audience who've read P.G. Woodhouse will be familiar with the word rum, broadly translating as strange or unaccountable. And I said, what, what do you mean it's a rum business? He said, well, quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, you don't mind my saying so, sir. He said, I think it's rather below stairs rather below stairs, an incredibly snobbish expression, i.e. where the servants live. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, Mr. Speaker, sir, you occupy a very important position in this house. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, of course, in recognition of that, the very, very, very arduous duties that you discharge, we give you and your, your wife an apartment on the, on the estate where you live with your, your children, absolutely right. He said, but quite frankly, sir, if people want to know what the Speaker does and how this house works, you should bloody well come into the gallery and observe the proceedings of the chamber uh, and what the Speaker uh, rules and has to say and how uh, events are managed. So the idea, sir, that you should go trogging around visiting schools and going into drafty, 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 drafty village halls and, uh, for meetings of the Women's Institute and so on. He said, well, uh, well, I think it's beneath the dignity of the office. I think it's beneath the dignity of the office. And I said, well, I don't agree with that at all. I think that, you know, I mean, I'm, important. I'm not important. 
I mean, I'm not important at all other than I hope to my wife and children, but the office of speaker is important. I occupy this important position. I've got to get out there and talk about Parliament and be questioned by people and listen to people and engage with people, hear from people. And I find it extraordinary. He said, well, we'll just have to agree to differ about that. And I thought, well, we will. So those are the changes I tried to make invigorate the chamber, make the place look a bit more like the country we're charged to represent, and try to have some sort of dialogue with the public. But, you know, did I succeed? Who was it that said all political careers end in failure, for that is the nature of politics and of human affairs? I won't name that person because he was what would now be called a Brexiteer. But look, I tried to make a difference. And I made mistakes because to err is human. There were things I didn't get round to doing. Other things perhaps I should have done, but I did my best. And I suppose the point I always make, Andrew, as is true quintessentially of you in your public work, outside the House, around the country, and in the House of Lords, I behaved honestly. You know, people will agree with me or disagree with me, but people always say they want politicians who behave honestly and do what they believe to be right. I did come up against some very, very, very reactionary forces very change resistant forces, people who never wanted to do anything differently. And I frequently encountered people say, you can't do that, Mr. Speaker. And I would say, well, it's never been done. Or you've got to do it this way. And I would say, well, it's always been done this way. These sorts of lazy arguments. And I, I rejected them. And you know, I did fight many battles on those fronts, some of which have come back to haunt me over the years. Actually, the full quotation from that person who will be nameless was that all political careers uh, failures except those cut short by death. But we're delighted, John, that you're happy juncture. And your 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 career was not cut short. Uh, you were a great modernizing speaker. I said when you were in the post that I think you were the greatest speaker since Speaker Lentil in the 1640s who ejected King Charles the First from the chamber of the House of Commons when he turned really? up trying to arrest the the five members. And I completely stand by that judgment and listening to you speaking in a scintillating fashion, but also with real passion about modernizing Parliament and its practices to bring it much more into accord with the modern country that we are. I think that will have struck a real chord with members of the European movement, because part of the reason why we're Europeans is that we want to see us as a much more modern country, which means having a much closer and more effective relationship with our neighbours. You know, the relationship between Britain and Europe historically has been terrible. And uh, we've had wars in Europe, and it's only in the recent past that we've actually been able, on a systematic way, to do trade rather than to fight wars. And that's surely yes. what being modern is all about. So it's been fantastic. Absolutely, Andrew. I, can I just echo that and say, you know, I didn't say this, I completely echo what you've just said. And of course, we're proud of the best in our country. No side of the Brexit argument has a monopoly on patriotism. But I must admit, I don't know about you, it sticks in my gullet because it's so down market and so low grade and so substandard. When now and again you hear conservative politicians saying things like, you know, we're determined to make this the best country in the world. It is utterly banal. It's banal. We're not better than France or Germany or Italy or the Netherlands, or Spain, you know, these are wonderful European nations. And I think, you know, we've got more in common with them, and it would make much more sense to be amongst them than to hive ourselves off and behave as though rule Britannia applies. It hasn't applied for a very, very, very long time. And frankly, all to the good that it doesn't. And, you know, let's wake up and operate in the world which exists and with the, the world as it functions, not as it used to do. That brilliant riff leads to my very final question, which you need only give a one word answer to. I don't know if you're capable of giving one word answers to questions, but you might. You might be able to. It's from Louise Brown. Would John consider a role within the European movement? Consider a role within the European movement. We would be delighted to have you as one of our ambassadors, John. And if you had just went and uh, spoke to some of our local branches, say what you said in the last five minutes, you'll have them cheering in the aisles for many months to come. 
Well, I can't give a one word answer, but I would consider it. <laughs> That's Thank good. You. That's really kind of you. Thank you very much. It's been Thank a you. fantastic hour and a half, a, a, a wide range of subjects. Very uplifting and positive and optimistic is my verdict on it, that John said that we could do so much more together than we can apart. And that's true of us as a movement and all we're seeking to do, as well as the country and its relations with its neighbours. And I know we have many hundreds of people who've been engaged in this conversation this evening. Many of them won't be members of the European movement. We are only as powerful as our membership. It's what we can achieve together that's so much greater than what we can do as individuals. And if you don't belong to the European movement, go on uh, Google, www.europeanmovement. You can join. It's only £3 a month. And it's in one of the greatest causes, I think, of modern Britain, which is that we should be an outward-looking, engaged, internationalist country that is welcoming to our neighbours and not uh, desert islands, in a fearful and introverted and inward looking uh, relationship. Michael Heseltine, who we referred to uh, earlier, famously said that the only person who is truly sovereign is the person who is alone on the desert island and they may not survive the night. And the European <laughs> movement is a standing refutation of them. So it's great to have had you all here this evening. We're hugely grateful to you, John, for sparing us the time and giving us your very frank and really interesting reflections both on your political career and on the political situation. I hope those of you who aren't members of the European movement will join. I hope you'll remain engaged and it only remains for me to wish you all a very, very good evening. Thank you. Thank you folks.